Good morning, a warm welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum to those joining us on Zoom and those joining us on Facebook and here in person at the Mountain View Senior Center. My name is Ray Sunby, president of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a secular and reality-based philosophy of life that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. If these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the humanist community if you have not yet done so. Membership forms are available on our website. A special welcome to those who are with us for the first time. We invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find all of our events listed on the website. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate to our organization on our website, www.humanists.org. Okay, thank you, Ray. I'm Alex Havasi, I'm Vice President of the Humanist Community. Today, our own uh, Masuma Ahmed will present a video of her talk, uh, The Fusion of South Asian Folk Art in Western Modern Art. She'll discuss and answer questions after the, after the video. Uh, Masuma is an internationally acknowledged artist. Uh, <clears throat> her work captures the essence of women, diaspora, social, excuse me, social issues and science. Um, she's also done uh, art, uh, sidewalk art on New York and Palo Alto for uh, the Black, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Masuma, would you like to introduce the video? Thank you, Alex. Um... Yeah, I had a, uh, in November uh, of 2023, I had a solo art exhibit in Los Altos Public Library, the main library on San Antonio Road. And I gave a presentation how I intermingled the Western and the South Asian folk art uh, uh, to create uh, another dimension to my artwork. And so that was the theme and someone videoed that presentation. So that will be the presentation. Here I'll make uh -huh, in YouTube. And if you have any questions, uh, and then there are some paintings I brought for you to, uh, to share with the, the audience. Uh, so if you are interested uh, or have any questions, please ask questions and I'll be happy to answer those questions. And also for your information, I have another art exhibit coming up in February at the Main Library of Palo Alto, City of Palo Alto, titled Celebration of Women in Diaspora Art, a Women's Memoir. So you're all welcome to come and visit and see my exhibit there. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present the fusion of South Asian folk art and the Western art. Okay, thank you everyone to come over and seeing all these beautiful faces and the familiar faces and they're all of my friends. So I really appreciate my friends showing up to encourage me to present my work. Thank you again. So why fusion art? But before I answer my question about why, I'll read a poem. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. So visit my side. If you're interested, it's called coming over. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate for giving me the opportunity to share 
that maddening dance, going out of this ordinariness, that exceptional experience that I mentioned at the beginning, we can create that. We can be part of that universe through, as Farmians do. We will be women with the maddening aspirations and inspirations. Thank you again. And you can see. Thank you. Masuma? Yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll try to answer them. Jerry. Should I wait? Oh. Yeah, I saw a peacock that looked like it had a human eye. I'd like to know the story behind that. What did you say? <laughs> I, I saw a peacock that had a human eye. It was a mod, mod Yeah, mod. there is the peacock there. <laughs> Yeah, and, but it has a human eye, not a peacock eye. There's a peak, uh, that's a Madhuvani art form. So I just uh, follow the tradition of Madhuvani. So in uh, women tend to integrate a lot of their stories in animals, but it also has the human aspects to it. Uh, it's like also in the deer, for example, we see beautiful eyes. But it's the representation of human eyes in, in, the, in the deer. Also, Does that answer your question? Yeah. Also, uh, Madhubani, where is that? Excuse me? Madhuban, where, where is that? Madhubani, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, that originated in Nepal, in Mithila region, by the, mostly by the rural uh, women, marginalized women. And then it... It was such a strong art form. It spread all across, not all across India and Bangladesh, but part of you know, some of the states like Bangladesh, West Bengal, Orissa, and Assam, and also went to South India as well. So one last question, which is, do you have anything from Sri Lanka? Excuse me? Do you have anything from Sri Lanka? I mean, it's Sri, Sri Lanka is, you know, it's, a, it's a basically at the tip of the southern tip of the India. Sri Lanka. Yeah. No, I don't have anything. Okay. From there. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, I was also wondering. You, you mentioned you take took courses. I was wondering how much do the courses you take influence your art? If uh, can you come closer? I'm yeah, sorry yeah. about. Am I going over the air? Okay. I was wondering how much um, the courses you took in art. How much did that influence you? How much course I took? The courses, yeah. When you, you went to school I, to study art? I took art. classes. Uh, first, I took class in, at Yale. Before that, when I was uh, young, very young, I took classes and workshops in Bangladesh Art Institutes. And also, there was a famous artist. He offered some workshops. I took that in Bangladesh. And then when I came here um, at Yale, I took one course from a very famous artist. <laughs> and then I took another class here at Stanford. So that's all my yeah, what, background. What I, was, what I was really wondering is, is, would you have painted something different if you hadn't taken the courses? I haven't taken that many because I'm a self-taught artist, basically. <laughs> OK, so it's, it's, it's there to learn techniques. Uh, every, I think every artist has the same tech. Uh, they're their own techniques. It's individual. Uh -huh. As I mentioned uh, also in my presentation, that each artist mm. lives in their own emotional space with their own experiences. So they represent themselves and their space into their art form. So it's very individualistic from that perspective. Yes, yeah, Susan? Hi, Masuma. I'm sorry, I missed the first part, but you know what I want to say? I was at that presentation. I was extremely impressed. Uh, and you had the uh, many more artworks at the Los Altos Library at that time. So um, I don't know if you had mentioned you were coming up with the Palo Alto exhibit. I did, yeah, okay. it's in February. Okay, um, you know, so, you know, I just love the vibrancy and the colors and the, and the movement of your art. I mean, it's just really fluid. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I was also going to comment on some of the artwork up here. 
and especially the, the large one next to the word Friday. And I, I've, I've often find a, just a picture of a face is somehow very relaxing. I don't get that from animals, just human faces. Thank you. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe we could uh, span. Did we get a good view of the artwork on the on the side here? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Paul? You, uh, at one point, Masuma, you, you uh, talked about uh, the peacock and the personal rendering of the peacock and then the computer rendering of the peacock. Could you talk about that a little more? Yeah, what I do, like I did on a fabric, uh, the peacock, a Madhavani art, using the Madhavani art forms, as you can see when I presented it there. And then I transferred that into, compu into my computer. And then, as you can see, this is the computer part of my traditional art. So it's basically, I did it in traditional, I did a traditional artwork using acrylic paints on a fabric. And then I take a picture of that art and put it into the computer. And then I do some massaging or editing and that's how I create that. And I can also come up with different colors from the tradition, because in traditional art, you just do one and that's it. But in computer, in digital art, you can change the colors. And I can edit that uh -huh, in real time and make a different one. So that's why I do it. And also I can create a lot of layers in digital art as well. So I intermix my different art from traditional world into one art form. So you would, with, with, the, uh, with the first one where you've done it with your brush or whatever instrument you used to create it. Yeah. That's an expression of Masuma. That's right. How much it, after it's filtered through the computer is still Masuma? Okay, uh, let's take this one. Here, that art from, this is still in, mm -hmm. I first created that in computer first. This is the other way around. I created an art in my computer and it's very intense, even in the digital form because I'm sitting there and I'm expressing myself in another dimension. And then I, after I created that in my computer, I said, why not do it also in the traditional? So this is an acrylic on um, canvas. So then it's transferred the dive um, in the reverse way. I did it and I see the intensity in both emotional space, whether it's digital or in the traditional, it's just the engagement. It's just uh, saying, presenting yourself irrespective of what platform you use. And that's, and that's why I also feel the richness in the street art. When I walked around in Bronx area, especially, uh, all this street art, those neighborhood kids, I can feel it. So it's, it doesn't matter what platform you use, it's this emotional space that you, want to express through. So it's independent of platforms. So your goal in creating art is the emotional experience that the viewer has or that the emotional, your, the, the emotional component, feelings 
that you experience when you look at th this version as compared to that version? Do you is it a, a different a, emotional experience? From the the outside environment, for example, does influence a lot. That's why I mentioned about the street art. It influenced me. And also the stories I hear from people when I was uh, in New York. And even here, um, my hairdresser, for example, she's a Vietnamese woman. I listen to her stories. And then I, I want to create that, but Again, it's in my emotional space because I cannot enter her emotional space, but I have the story and I can relate to it. There is a common space across women. And that's how it grabbed, capture and create her in my own emotional space with her stories. So it's beyond me, but it's, influ uh -huh. it's beyond just my emotional space, but it's also integrated with my emotional space. Hard stories into my emotional space. Uh, Helen, I see you got your hand up. Um, hi, Masuma. I really like your art, especially the one where you change from the bright colored bird to the black and white and gray one with all the bright colors in the background. And I guess that's some of the same digital um, re rearranging but I wanted to comment that it seems a little bit like, well, Paul, I guess was, or no, Jerry was asking about whether it's still your art. Yes, it's still your art. It's like making- Speak up loud, sorry. It's, it's like a monotype print where you make one print and then you do it again and then you change it. Yeah, it's two different emotional space. It happens. Um, it's not exactly, I would say, overlap with each other. Like I get engaged whether I'm sitting in front of my computer and create or whether I'm creating um, on a canvas on my easel. Uh, and mm -hmm. I have to admit though, when I do the brush strokes in the traditional world, like this one here, if you can see it, this is basically my memory of the New England fall. If you can see it, it's on yes. wood. That feeling of brush strokes, I cannot get that in digital world, I have to admit. It's just the hand also play a big role in the traditional world. That brush stroke I create gives me a sense of empowerment. It's a very different than when I do it in digital world. But the digital world has another art form, which I call mystical. I get involved into that mystical part of the digital world when I create. And then when I create a lot of layers, as I mix, for example, I can mix this traditional art with say another art form, with my another a traditional art, and I mix them and I create another art which is uh, very different from the traditional world. Yes, that doesn't have that hand experience, but it has another, it, get, it uplifts me to another world, let's put it that way. Right, well, it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit different from your, your hand holding a brush versus your finger uh, on the keyboard <laughs> and the cursor. Exactly, yeah. And, the keyboard and the cursor don't play that much role, to be very honest. Mm -hmm. It's the representation of another world in the computer um, screen. That kind of gives me the depth of I'm traversing into, say, in physics world in a deep space. <laughs> so in a Milky Way, I'm traversing. I have that freedom to go beyond uh, just the computer screen. But it's not the cursor or the keyboard. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Jerry. Uh, Paul, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, let, let, I'll, let, I'll take them after them. Okay, Susan. 
Uh, wasn't there an old author, Marshall McLuhan, that talked about the medium is the message? Um, and somehow I feel this in your in the question that Paul had about medium, you know, whether it's hand medium with brushes or digital, it's all it's all in there, you know, but your emotion is coming through in all of it. And it can be different than like the mystical part you're talking about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for explanation. <laughs> it's helpful. Okay, Jerry. Uh, Paul was next. Uh, let's not fight. Well, I spent half, I mean, I live half my life in New England. So I'm wondering this New England fall, what part of New England was that? Oh, I lived in New Haven. Okay. Oh, right. Yeah, I should it's know. in Connecticut. Yeah, I know where New Haven is. Yeah, that's where Yale is. Okay, yeah. now I, I understand. So that's the fall color, the autumn. Yeah, yeah. And, and the other thing is you emphasize women a lot in, in all this stuff. I was wondering why so much emphasis on women. I, I don't know if other women do the same thing. Men certainly don't, but I can understand the difference. But I guess uh, women have been subjugated. <laughs> In a patriarchal society for so long, we need a voice. And I think most women do feel that camaraderie among themselves. And I'm being a diaspora woman, I can con and also I can connect and relate to women much better than males, for example. And I want to create that voice, our voice, a woman's voice through my artwork and also through my writing. Is there a difference between subjugated and, and uh, oppressed? You said women are subjugated. Well, I would have thought that women are uh, oppressed. So what's, is there a difference? Oh, I don't know. Maybe then there are differences, subtle differences, but I'm not familiar with it. But I feel that women don't get as much chance, especially in many countries, in many cultures where women, we as women also don't kind of like we blindly accept some of the traditional stuff without even questioning whether it's detrimental to our growth. And so that's why I feel so strongly about representing women. Okay. Well, I would include the uh, U.S. as being uh, not that kind to women, so... But women are also repressed here as well. Uh, like, what do we see in the PR? How the women are dressed? Do we see naked men that much? No, as a product, but we see a lot of representation of women's body as a product. Why? Well, also, it seems like being male is the default. Huh? Being male, being a man is the default. <laughs> it's the assumption. <laughs> Oh, make this uh, the last question. I don't have anything worthy of that. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm just going to comment. Be thankful that you don't see that many naked men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one, one more, one more comment, Senna. I'm so glad that you bring up the point. Uh, of how oppressed women are and how unaware so many of us are of it. And, uh, and as, as far as the way women and men dress on TV, I, I always see it as a, a thing of the, how free the women are. They can do that. Uh, they, and the men are all cuddled up in their Navy suits and the women are wearing whatever they damn well please. And I think very liberating. It may be liberating, but it's also women are conditioned. Let me give you an example. At corporate wall, women, uh, why do women have to wear blue suits or black suits? Huh? But that's the norm. That's the tradition. And who imposed on women to do that? That's the patriarchy. The patriarchy prevails in the corporate world, not just in social system, but also in the corporations. So we have to wear not our blazingly colorful outfits to express ourselves. We follow the norm, uh, male norm, 
of wearing yeah. black suits or um, blue suits. Hey, why do men have to wear ties? I think it's good good question. <laughs> you, you don't have to. I just choose to. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, thank hey, you, Ms. Sumi. You've been well conditioned. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm free. Okay, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my work and present my women's voice. I think the size of the war is you don't get as much oxygen, and that's a good thing to be a manager. <laughs> it's actually